So everyone at home has already heard you been playing, um, and I'm, I'm sure it was wonderful. Um, this is happening before the concert, and I'm so happy to be able to talk to you, Bob Reynolds, today um, and find out more about your life. And I do want to kind of start at the beginning because um, people might not know that you might have become a very famous filmmaking clarinet alto player, <laughs> right? Wow, you did some homework. <laughs> <laughs> I tried anyway. Um, so back when you were 13, you actually wanted to become a movie maker, and yes. music wasn't really much of your life you played a little bit piano i think yes but I mean, then what happened <laughs> um that's a yeah that's exactly right i what happened was i was making these home movies um and i was doing i was acting in commercials and some small movies and things just to earn enough i didn't like acting but i had sort of fallen into it mm -hmm. and i used the money to buy video making equipment so old you know like vcrs and editing bays televisions all this stuff and i had i was just always making these short little movies with my my younger brother and the kids in the neighborhood and friends and whatnot and then i would show them to my family and their families i would have these little you know movie showings of what we made and the credits would roll and it would say written by directed by bob reynolds <laughs> written by bob reynolds produced by like every credit had my name you know cameraman editor everything and then when it came to music it would say just other people like Vanilla Ice or, you know, like U2 or whatever I found on the radio that I would dub into the videos. So what happened was I thought, I, I, you know, there's something incomplete here. I need to be able to do the music as well. And so I signed up for band in, you know, junior high school. Um, I had three choices. It was like home economics, which I don't even know what that is, is that anymore. It's like sewing or it's something. It's like sewing yeah. or, I don't know, cooking. I'm, <laughs> uh, wood shop, like, you know, making things with wood and band. Those are the three options. So I signed up for band. I didn't have any particular interest in a specific instrument. I just wanted to learn how to write music for these movies I was making. And, um, I thought, well, I don't really like the feel of the trumpet. Like the band director gave us different instruments mm -hmm. to try. And I thought, well, the, maybe the clarinet like seems okay. So I told my mom I'd like to play the clarinet. And then she found out what it cost to rent a clarinet and we just didn't have the extra money for that at the time. And she was telling a neighbor about that. And our neighbor offered um, her daughter's old saxophone, which was sitting in the attic. She said, well, we have a saxophone in the house and Bob's welcome to use it if you'd like. And so I said, sure. And, and I took it inside and I put it together and I just started figuring out how to play it. And I went into the bathroom and when I played it in the bathroom and heard like the reverb and everything, I thought this is really cool. And one thing led to another and within about a year or so, I was um, really focused on the saxophone and ended up going to a performing arts high school and that kind of set me in a new direction. But wasn't it that you were playing the alto saxophone first and then yes. you were trying to get into the band and you thought... Oh my, how did you even find this out? <laughs> yes. And, the, and there, the guy, there was already a guy playing the alto saxophone. He, he said, no, wait, I don't, I don't want to be like in the second row. I want to be in the first row. So you decided to switch. Did you ever regret that you decided to play the tenor saxophone? No, not at all. <laughs> but you're... Wow. I don't, I'm trying to think. Sorry. I'm like, how did... Where is that? That's... Wow. You went deep. That's amazing. I tried. Um, I tried. <laughs> yes. I, I started on the alto sax and... I was just for a few years playing in, you know, junior high band, concert band, nothing fancy. I wasn't good at reading music, but I had kind of a natural ear. So I would sit in band and I would just make up my own parts. I didn't know that that was called improvising at the time. I just thought it sounded good. And the band director would eventually, he would figure it out. It would always take him a while, but he would say like, wait a minute, something's not right. And, and then he would call me out. He did not like that I was doing that. Um, and then I, I saw this performing arts high school called Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. And this was in Jacksonville, Florida, where I was living. Um, I saw them perform, and that kind of changed things for me because I saw somebody maybe a year and a half older than me mm -hmm. playing the saxophone so well, like on such a different level than what I knew it could be, that that sparked the fire like i thought i mean i have to figure out that i have to go to that school and then as you said i i we did a little homework and found out that that particular guy was a junior in high school which mean he he had one more year to go but the lead tenor player was a senior and he was going to graduate and there's only two altos and two tenors in a big band so i thought if i stay on alto then i'm gambling that i'm going to be the one who gets into that one other slot but if i switch to tenor i have at least twice as many options you know I've, so that i switched reading about you it seems like you were always very focused and i think your, your first album was called uh, can't wait for perfect yes which 
kind of describes to me how what kind of person you are that you you know you didn't want to set, set for second row alto you wanted to be the first um <laughs> how does that hinder you in some ways and also make you a better musician in other ways wow um yeah it <laughs> both of those things are true uh it hinders me in a lot of ways because i mean i think perfectionism is um for I've always felt that like I've I've been very detail oriented and focused and and very and cared very much about like things being a certain way not in a I wouldn't think in an OCD way not like oh my gosh the fork and knife have to be lined up just like this but details of of the projects that I'm like if I was a movie I was making a song I'm writing the way that I'm playing the saxophone if it's a graphic design thing a way, anything that I'm involved in writing creating creating composing recording I care so much about the details of those things being just right. Mm. Um, the problem with that is, yeah, it can also be a, something that really holds me back from from doing anything, from putting anything out. And so the title of that album was um, kind of, it just came from me being in a place where I knew it was time to start putting what I had out, even though it, I didn't feel like it was ready or I didn't trust. I mean, I felt like it was ready on one level, but on another level, I was just scared. Perfectionism, I think that word is actually just a fancier word for fear. <laughs> I mean, True. it sounds really nice to call myself a perfectionist. Oh, I don't, I, I haven't gotten to that yet because it's just not right. But really, it's kind of a way of hiding a lot of the time. Um, on the other hand, um, it does help me get things at least to a. It might. It, there's no getting too perfect, but it have a high bar for the for what I'm trying to achieve in anything and so I'm glad that I have that but it is something I wrestle with a little bit I do think as a jazz musician it's probably really hard to have that goal because of all the improvisa improvisation and stuff that you ne can never say or one it's hard for someone who's a perfectionist to say that was a perfect um solo exactly <laughs> it doesn't happen so that so every every time I play I'm confronted with the fact that it's not achievable <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about uh, a guy called Bunky Green who said, um, don't stay here. Um, Bunky Green is a tremendous saxophonist, alto saxophonist. He used to be the head of the jazz department at, at the University of North Florida mm -hmm. in Jacksonville. And the arts high school that I went there, a lot of people, when they graduated, if they were going to continue, like the people in the jazz program, they would go to the University of North Florida to study with Bunky because mm -hmm. he was... He's legendary. I mean, he he's done so much, and he he's from Chicago, and he used to play with Sonny Stid, and he's just a monster of a player and teacher. Um, I went to the school to have a, a talk with him. I don't remember if it was an, an audition per se, but I went to his office, and so this was during my senior year of high school when I was looking at colleges. And it was it was a given that you were going to study music, right? Yes. Okay. That much I knew. I knew that since arriving at that high school. Um, probably my sophomore year, I, I thought, yeah, this, I'm going to do this. Um, but there were a bunch of different colleges I was looking at. And one of the options was, well, maybe I'll go to university of North Florida for two years and then migrate to New York. That was seemed to be a common pattern for mm -hmm. some, some people. Anyway, so I walked into the school and I got to, I knocked on Bunky's door and he, you know, I came in, we were there for a couple minutes and he said, you know what, let's take a walk. Mm -hmm. And we walked around the, uh, the college campus. Um, and yeah, he told me, don't come here. <laughs> he said, why? Do you know why? At that point in time, um, I mean, I was just getting started. I was just a, a kid, but I'd had the good fortune through the combination of being at that school mm -hmm. and the environment that was going on in Jacksonville, the music scene there at that time, where I had some really good mentors who would invite me to sit in on their gigs so there which, was a, which might also mean that you were good but maybe just saying yeah i mean i think they were they were very generous and um compassionate and encouraging mm -hmm. i mean i i i had something you know um going on but i was i was just starting you know but i had a lot of enthusiasm mm -hmm. and like i was working really hard and um you know i they would just be they would they would let me come sit in on tunes with this person's tree this there's a guy named kevin bales a wonderful piano player who lives down in atlanta and he would invite me to come play with him so and kevin taught at the university of north florida so basically i was as a senior in high school i was getting to perform just a little bit but i, I knew the guys who were already the professors mm -hmm. at that college and so bunky was basically saying don't stay here because you'll be a big fish in a small pond and he's like you need to go and be a small fish in a big pond um, so he wasn't telling me where to go. He was just saying, don't, 
you know, I don't think you should come here. You should go. And and I ended up going on to Boston and to Berkeley from that. But it, but the fact that Bunky, if Bunky had, you know, maybe had said something different, mm-hmm. and I, I might have, you know, stayed there. Who knows? Things go a different way. But um, that I thought that was really cool of him to do. Absolutely. And um, you just said Kevin Bales. I think you recorded an album with him in, in New York a couple are, of years um, later. You are really impressed with Emily, I have to say. <laughs> well, thank this you. Is, uh, <laughs> this is pretty. You just set a very high bar for all future <laughs> interviews. Um that's correct. The, my very my first album that's like a full album. I made a, an, an EP of four songs in college, but my first album, which is called Live at the Jazz Corner, mm-hmm. that piano player Kevin Bales played on. So that was a huge thing for me because he was so important to me. I mean, he still is, but he was an, a mentor to me early on. And then to kind of go away to college, finish college, be in New York for a while. And then I came back down south to, uh, where did we do that? Hilton Head, South Carolina, mm-hmm. um, and have him play on my record was a real thrill. You know? And you also, I, well, actually I actually heard an interview. We talked about the drummer on that album, on the live album, yep. um, that uh, he kind of, he, you said he had a built in time and which is a really important thing for a drummer, obviously. And people underestimated how important a drummer is for, um, for a set. So I'd like to maybe talk about your drummer on, uh, I mean, we're kind of jumping back and forth, but I do want to talk about your band and we're already sure. going, you know, talking so long. Um, you are here with your new album quartet and yes. you are here with your band, which quartet. also recorded the album quartet, yes. which came out on the 15th of, of May. Yes. Tell me about the band members and what they mean to you. And, and of course we'll start with the, with your drummer. Um, who's of course he has the time built in, I hope. Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it playing with, playing with great drummers is sort of, um, it's just always a goal for me. Like I want to always be playing with, I mean, it, it's the difference between the music feeling alive and full and exciting and the opposite of all that, you know, <laughs> um, if the, if the drum chair is not strong, if that, if it's not happening, it's, it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. And when I say strong, I don't just mean loud or forceful, but just somebody who has this sort of the right energy and life force mm-hmm. and, and, you know, there's all these different names for it, pocket and feel and, and time, et cetera. But, um, yeah, Sean Horton, who's mm-hmm. playing drums with me now and who's a part of this band for the last few years, we started, I met him in Los Angeles probably close to 10 years ago now, and we've played together in lots of different circumstances over the years, but over the last two years, we've, you know, developed this group, and uh, he's so dynamic, he can be such a powerful play, like, just incredible abilities, and but has a huge dynamic range, he can also just be simmering and play mm-hmm. soft and play just a couple of notes and dynamics is such a huge part of what I care about in music. Mm-hmm. So to have other players that are coming from the same place makes a world of difference. And I think you're such a, a melodic artist. You're not, you're, you're not, of course you're into harmonies as well, but the melody is very important to you. Yes. Sometimes drummers forget that yeah. in jazz. Yes. Um, and maybe Sean is on yeah, your level. Yeah, very, very true. I mean, it's, it's about serving the song. You know, I'm always interested in playing with musicians who their first priority is just serving the music mm-hmm. for what it is right now, not their own personal agenda. So ideally, if you're the, my best scenario is to be making music with people who have an extraordinary uh, wealth of ability that they can draw from lots of things they can do but they but they never feel like they need to do all those things every solo or every song or every set you know um and and that that sort of uh care for the melody the shape the arc of a tune uh is extraordinarily important and versus having somebody just do their thing on Mm -hmm. the drums Russin Sirotto, um, yeah. he's playing the, the piano. Yes, um, and you've known him for a while, I think. Yeah, for him also probably. I mean, we actually went to Berkeley together back in Boston, but I didn't know we didn't know one another mm-hmm. then. So I met him in Los Angeles probably six or seven years ago. Yeah. And how is it playing with him? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, you know, he just makes it easy. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he's he has huge ears, and again, there's no. Um, there's no script. There's nothing that there's no th- go to patterns and things. There's not things that he's just going to do every time. It's just open ears, sort of open heart, open mind, like ability to be spontaneous and vulnerable and care about the music for what's happening right now. And just, uh, it's, it's an every night is like a new, new discovery. And the, the ways that he goes, the different places that he takes the music is just colorful and exciting and so engaging. So it's a pleasure to play with him. And then there's Yannick on the um, bass. On the bass, yep. And he and I go back. He's actually one of my 
one of the few friends I have uh, that predate my knowing my wife whom I met in college. Um, so 20 years ago, and I met Yannick even before that um, at Berkeley. So we go back a long time, and we met in an ensemble at Berkeley playing, you know, playing music as 19-year-olds or something. Speaking of Berkeley, you met John Mayer at Berkeley at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yes, I did. I did a recording <laughs> session uh, with him there in... I want to say it was February of 97. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody asked me to do a recording session at 2.30 in the morning. And I said, and yes. People don't, I've never heard. I mean, maybe I, I don't, that happens a lot at Berkeley. Or so I've, Berkeley, I mean, <laughs> things have, I'm sure that's developed, you know, over time. But at that time, mm -hmm. there was limited recording studio space. So let's say at a school of however many thousands of people attending there, there were only um, maybe three studios like this. Uh, maybe actually only one like this and then smaller ones. So everybody was competing for blocks of time mm -hmm. and they were used for classes during the day so they only really opened up at night for student use and so the reason i said yes to that session was was selfishly i hoped that by doing the engineer a favor because he needed to record a project oh. that then i could maybe get some studio time for me and it, and that's just the way those sessions started they started late late into the night and uh, and yeah it was on that recording where i met john and um, and played with him there for the first time. And I think uh, you hit it off because you both have the same opinion about Branford's Miss Alice and Sting's work together. I mean, maybe at the mo at that night that we met, we probably didn't have that conversation. But years later, we you know we sort of did. And I mean, just the way that we both approach music, we had a, a strong affinity for that for Sting and the Police, but especially for Sting and those years. Um, I guess sort of late '80s, early '90s uh, era that he was doing putting out records, and, and Branford was playing saxophone in it. And so, yeah, I mean, I've always loved the way that combination, Branford and Sting. And so, when I got years later, it was ten years later when I joined John's band. It was '07, um, and that sort of opportunity, that collaboration, kind of wove its way into a lane that for me felt very reminiscent of what. Branford did with Sting. And I mean, some people who listen to jazz say, how can you do pop music, that kind of stuff? And, and you said, um, try and, you try to become a part of pop texture while still maintaining your artistic interest. Yeah. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, um, partially I'm still figuring it out. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, I guess what I mean by that is that I'd been in so many, I've seen so many situations where there's a saxophone player in a group that's not a jazz group, so pop, rock, soul, whatever. Um, and then, you know, there comes a moment maybe and there's a sax solo, and it's somehow, oftentimes, of course not every time, um, it seems so divorced from the music. It's like there's this thing going along, there's these mm -hmm. textures and colors and everything, okay, we're in the song, and then the saxophone player takes a solo and it, and it seems out of left field, like, oh, this guy just thinks he's got his you know, 16 bars now and he needs to prove to the world like how many notes he can play. And that just held no interest for me. Um, so what I mean is, I mean, over the years, even before John, I spent about five, six years playing with a singer named Jonah Smith as a five-piece band. And I wasn't just taking saxophone solos all the time. I was looking for ways to be a part of the band, the fabric of that music with a saxophone, but it's not a horn section. You know, and if it's not a horn section, like three horn players, and it's not, you're just taking a solo, then what does that leave? You're either not playing or you are playing. So I was like, how, what ways can I add to the song in a developmental way? So in pop music, um, oftentimes pop music gets, I feel like oftentimes jazz musicians who are in, in the jazz snob stage, which is, I think we all go through. Some people never leave it. Is it jazz musicians, I'm saying? Um, it's easy to be like, oh, there's only two or three chords or something, you know? Um, but the way that pop music is structured, the best of it anyway, is in layers. So from an orchestral standpoint, it's like, you don't do the same thing in the second verse. That The first verse happens, and then the second verse, something else happens. And then there's the pre-chorus and the chorus. And then the third verse, there's a new element. So there's an, a layering. And that's kind of what I'm thinking about in that in that realm. And um, you're taking Branford Marsalis to the Tennessee woods um, <laughs> next sounds... week, I think, or in two weeks. Um, and they've been doing it for four years. Yeah. It's a camp. Is that what you talk about there, too, about how to do yes. that properly? Or what is the yeah, camp so all Yeah, so the about? camp is called the Inside Outside Retreat mm -hmm. for saxophone players. And the idea behind that name, the Inside Outside, is just that it's we're trying to, to help players of all ages and abilities kind of discover how to really 
go inward, to listen to them, to not be so concerned with all just everything outside, but but how to listen and how to make how to get to a place of space where you can make music in the moment. And yeah, this is our fourth year doing it, and we've had past guests have been Joshua Redman and Chris Potter and Kirk Whalem, and this year we have Branford Marsalis. And um, you also do a vlog where you talk about so many things. People write you questions and you answer. Yeah. Um, you've talked about your family, which I thought was so interesting, being a daughter of a jazz musician myself. Oh, um, yeah. And how it is to have a father who's not h- home a lot and yeah. that kind of stuff. So you guys really have to check it out and, and look at it because we're running out of time, gotcha. unfortunately. I do have a, a couple of things that, I, that are really important to me as uh, a question to you. Um, because they, you have wonderful songs in your album qu- quartet called um, uh, Down South or Hollywood Startup. Um, and as a musician who plays songs without lyrics, mm-hmm. do you sometimes get, I don't know, annoyed or are you upset when people don't understand what you're trying to say? Or is, it, is that up to everyone? No, I mean, the, you know, maybe sometimes I get, I get the question, like, how, where do you come up with titles, you mm-hmm. know, for the songs? But they're always an after i don't want to say an afterthought but the title comes after the music and it's more like i when the music happens then i'm looking for something that at least to me encapsulates the feeling the vibe the the sentiment of what what that what that music sonically represents like what emotion maybe what kind of space it represents to me um as far as anybody else's takeaway from that i mean they're free to have <laughs> any experience possible but i mean i think there's a fair amount of kind of that dramatic um, story narrative in our in our music, and we're here in the Riverside Studios here in in Cologne, and this studio is very special. It's actually uh, the the only studio in Germany with flexible wood, um, which makes the acoustic wonderful. Wow. Um, I mean, you haven't played yet, but everyone else watching right now has seen you play. Um, yeah. What kind of feeling is it playing a studio like this with with uh, you know people watching you so closely? Well. I love that, mm-hmm. actually. I mean, we did quartet. That's how we recorded it in a studio, very similar to this environment with an audience present. And the reason we did that was because um, we like that feeling of of being, again, you're just, you're being vulnerable. You're right there. It's happening right now. You're, it's, a, it's a level of risk that's different from just being in the studio where you might stop and start, oh, let's do that again. But I've, I've had a fair amount of experience with this now. Uh, the, la- the record I did before this called Guitar Band was also in a live in studio uh, audience environment. And, um, and then before that, the, an album I did with Snarky Puppy called We Like It Here. That my, was my first introduction to this way of working. And I found it just exhilarating. So. And I would have loved to talk to you more about Snarky Puppy and all the stuff you've done, but um, maybe you can say some more about in the next set here at the Riverside Studios. It's been a pleasure sure. talking to you. It's thank uh, you, wonderful. Emily. Likewise, um, I, I kind of uh, my dad asked me to end this on on a saxophone joke. Okay, may I? Oh, you have one. May I have one? Sure. Oh, do you have one? Oh, a saxophone. Yeah, joke? I have a. Sa- I have like uh, he gave me four. To, and yeah, I, also, I don't know oh, that do, I have a saxophone. I have one. Joke. It starts like it goes like this. Um, what do you call a girl who plays a saxophone? A sax goddess. Okay. Okay. And what do you call uh, 33 saxophones on the bottom of the ocean? A job well done. A good start. Okay. <laughs> Bob <laughs> Reynolds, close. thank you so much You're for welcome. your time. <laughs> and we look forward to hearing you guys play in the next couple of minutes. So, um, yeah, lean, lean back and enjoy this wonderful music here in the Riverside, Studi- Riverside Studios. And we have to talk again soon because I have all these questions, man. Wow. I <laughs> Thanks hope we so get much. To. Thank you. Thanks so much.